Hello everyone and welcome to a new GIGAM webinar. Today we will talk about distributed cloud storage and how it is good for ever changing business needs. I'm Erika Signoretti, GIGAM analyst for data storage and today joining me I have Aaron Brand, CTO of Citera. Hi Aaron, how are you? Hi Enrico, it's great to be here. So our agenda is uh, packed with a lot of interesting uh, discussion today. Uh, we will start with uh, talking about uh, the differences between uh, traditional NAS and distributed cloud storage. Then we will uh, uh, look at the post-COVID scenarios and how the, parad the, the paradigms have changed. We will also talk about distributed cloud storage and ransomware attacks, so how it, this kind of storage can prevent this kind of attack or help to uh, respond to this uh, kind of attack. And we <clears throat> will end with a, a short uh, discussion around the Gigam radar and uh, Citera position. So this is a very interactive webinar. Um, I like to throw uh, uh, some polls during the uh, the webinar, so please respond. This will help us to keep the conversation alive and, of course, uh, listen to your opinions. Also, uh, consider that at the end we have a Q&A session, so for uh, any um, question that you have in mind, just use the tool uh, uh, that you have uh, in this uh, webinar and uh, we will answer at the, at the end of the session. So, without any further ado, let's start with the uh, with the first pool. What is the most painful aspect of your current storage infrastructure? So data protection, so backups and disaster recovery, remote data access, infrastructure management, ransomware protection, or total cost of ownership. So the cost of the um, entire infrastructure from acquisition cost down to the management, day-to-day -day management and everything that we listed here. Consider that this is a very tough question because uh, when I ask this kind of question to my clients, the answers are very different depending on the size of the uh, of the client. So, Aaron, in your day-to-day uh, -day, uh, life with uh, with Citera, so what is the answer that you heard the most from your from your clients? So uh, we're hearing a lot about uh, data protection and uh, more and more uh, about ransomware. Uh, this is becoming a harder and, uh, uh, a problem for companies and they're becoming more aware of this. But I think uh, it's important to uh, differentiate between uh, the central storage or the storage at the core of the, the enterprise and edge storage, uh, where, which is located at the remote sites and at the uh, uh, branch offices and and today uh, given the, the COVID pandemic uh, users that are working from home or it's a small remote uh, uh, small branch offices and uh, really in the world of the edge uh, the problems become much more complicated how do you uh, back up information that's stored in a, in a small branch office without any IT staff or uh, on the computer of a remote employee so issues become much more complicated, uh, and all these issues are complicated in this in the edge scenario. Uh, the ransomware protection: How do you protect endpoints that are remote from ransomware? How do you recover your your data, and how do you back up uh, data that's stored in remote locations? And uh, of course, how do you manage uh, tens of remote sites or hundreds or thousands of remote users? So I think uh, this differentiation is very important. Yeah, and uh, uh, as you can see, our audience uh, answered uh, that ransomware protection is the you know one of the most uh, worrisome aspects of their infrastructure today when it comes to file storage in general. So th this is uh, important because we have uh, actually a section of this webinar that will touch on the edge and uh, uh, ransomware protection as well. So let's uh, let's go ahead and and start uh, to talk uh, a little bit. Uh, more in detail on what is uh, uh, distributed cloud storage. So I want to, uh, well, everybody knows what is a NAS today. So network larger storage. So you have a system connected to the network that shares files 
and uh, directories in uh, uh, in a local ala network okay this system because the nature of the protocols involved are uh, not reachable from uh, the internet actually you could try but actually protocols like nfs and smb are usually shutty protocols so the latency involved in moving a lot of small packet packets to uh, to move the basic information around it uh, creates a lot of problems okay and they are not designed for remote access so even if you have the bandwidth even if you have uh, an smb client that could connect to directly to the to your nas system in your uh, central location they are not designed to to deal with uh, uh, a huge amount of clients uh, talking at different latencies with uh, uh, untrusted connection and etc cetera, etc cetera. okay and as you probably know because this is the the standard of every infrastructure you have uh, a lot of uh, uh, challenges when you uh, have one of these systems it, you know you have to protect it so make backup copies you have to um, protect it against uh, uh, security threats you, you have to manage uh, scalability so having more capacity every time uh, you have more users or more files to manage etc etc et why distributed cloud storage is so different first of all we are talking about an infrastructure that is accessible from everywhere you could access it with uh, standard protocols like nfs and smb as we already mentioned so it can look like a nas system okay or you can access it uh, from the cloud maybe with the same protocols but it's actually a, a um, a different appliance, a virtual appliance that you can have uh, in the cloud, or there are other mechanisms that are more similar to enterprise sync and share. Okay, so where you have a client, maybe on a mobile phone, and you can download locally your file, or from a from a laptop, or even in um, in remote locations where you have only very few uh, PCs connected to the network. Okay, how do you do that? one of the uh, most important things is that you have a unique uh, uh, namespace that is uh, in the cloud potentially data is stored in an object store so it's an ideal scalable uh, system it's uh, uh, accessible from everywhere and uh, you have a management system in the in the middle here okay that uh, sometimes uh, uh, manage the connections manage additional services uh, uh, multi-tenancy etc uh, etc cetera, etc cetera, et cetera. and then you have the front uh, uh, the front end layer okay so access points this access point could be uh, simple clients on on a, on a desktop or could be um, much more sophisticated uh, appliances that can catch some of the files to uh, eliminate some of the latency problems and uh, they can have additional services as well so Aaron, did I give you a practical description of distributed cloud storage that is good enough? Do you have something to add here? Um, so uh, we, what, what I'm saying is uh, a lot of uh, our customers and uh, we're getting a lot of questions about the difference between tiering and caching. So there, there is some uh, uh, vendors have implemented tiering cap capabilities into their NAS products and uh, and they're often calling it a form of distributed cloud storage. But uh, what is really the difference between the tiering and the caching or global file system? And uh, so when we when we talk about tiering, uh, what the system does is it takes content from the NAS, which you don't uh, content that wasn't accessed for a long time, and it moves them to cloud storage. So it leaves behind some kind of a stub file. Uh, moves the uh, content uh, to cloud storage, and then when, if you uh, try to open this stub file, then you get information back from cloud storage. So this is a very simple approach, and it's a NAS-centric. You, you have a legacy device, and you move some of the data to the cloud. Now, caching or a global file system is, is uh, different in that uh, every all of the information is on the cloud. You move everything to the cloud, not only the uh, infrequently accessed data, and uh, and you have a local cache in multiple locations, which allows you to access the information uh, with local performance. 
So while uh, tiering and caching both uh, offer a, a, a form of uh, capacity extension to your local storage, uh, uh, actually the global file system or the caching is much more powerful since it allows you to collaborate across multiple sites on the same set of data. And it also uh, includes, uh, since your information is in the cloud, it includes built-in protections against uh, uh, ransomware, the ability to, uh, to recover from the cloud, the ability to, uh, to use multiple clouds at the same time, so multi-cloud capabilities. So um, it, it's very important in, in my view to, to understand the difference between tiering and uh, a global file system, which is what we really, I think, we're talking about here as distributed cloud storage. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so tiering is just uh, a feature of a NAS system, but actually in the end, from the front point, from the access point of view, doesn't change much. Uh, a global file system or distributed cloud storage system is something totally different because, again, you have the ability to access data from everything. So from the user's perspective, it's a totally different uh, experience. But le let's go a little bit more in detail with the differences and uh, how the two types of storage stand uh, against each other. So let's talk, for example, about infrastructure management. Okay. A single NAS system is not difficult to manage. Okay. And uh, there are several uh, ways for which you can uh, easily manage a single box full of disks and SSDs and uh, uh, give access to your user, create directories, volumes, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. The problem becomes more relevant when you have multiple of these boxes and actually they are distributed across geographies so in your organization you can have a, a system in your in a, every single remote office that you have and then they have to be synchronized somehow together they have been to, uh, you have to protect them etc so every single operation is multiplied by the number of of boxes you have and this is not only you know a, a small problem but actually there are other uh, issues for example, around uh, capacity utilization. Okay, you have some of these systems that are heavily utilized, the other that are really uh, almost empty, but you don't have a mechanism to distribute data in, in the system, so to uh, normalize use of the system and maybe uh, get the most out of the capacity that you have installed. Actually, for uh, a distributed uh, cloud storage system, we are talking about a totally different approach where you don't have uh, a, a single uh, system, but actually you have a, a cloud system. So you manage something centrally in the cloud, no matter how many point of access you have, no matter how many uh, users you have, and also the capacity. You, you manage capacity independently uh you know in, in a pay as you go fashion okay so you can expand or uh contract the 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 kind of capacity that you have under management by just by uh, allocating more resources to the system um again i ask you aaron if uh, if i missed something that is important that you see uh, on infrastructure management when you talk with your customers when you when you talk uh, with uh, your users yeah, so we're, we're um, uh, the efficiency uh, aspect is very important. Uh, often uh, we see that uh, uh, since the cloud uh, provides an elastic uh, form of storage and it's able to grow and contract, it's an ideal way to to have to store the, your excess capacity um, and uh, to reduce the amount of local footprint in in your uh, data centers or in your edge locations. And uh, really, that that enables you to use uh, to use the storage that you have at, at its peak capacity. So instead of, uh, you know, uh, in, in the past where you, you would buy a, you know, a NetApp filer and you would uh, fill it up to, uh, you know, 60% in order to uh, uh, have place for future growth, uh, you can use 100% of your local capacity and the system is smart enough to automatically move uh, or uh, to, to, to store only the frequently accessed information locally. Uh, and so it's much more efficient in, in terms of using your local uh, uh, local storage uh, resources. 
and uh, and it's also important uh, from an uh, you know an ecological footprint, a green footprint. You're saving a lot of energy. You're saving saving a lot of uh, having to uh, technicians that have to go to different locations and add uh, storage and devices. So it's it's good for for um, cost saving and for uh, the world in general. Yeah, power efficiency is always important, especially now that we can have all flash. But again, having even if we think about the all flash system and you think about remote offices, even the smallest of the all flash system with all the data protection that is necessary on a single box could be, uh, you know, too big for you know an office with uh, very few people in it. So. Um, and another point is data protection and disaster recovery. When you have a NAS system, you have to make backup copies and protect against disasters. So not just the backup copy, but having a mechanism to, in sometimes, replicate the data or move the uh, the backup copy to a remote location. It always depends on uh, your RPO and the RTO goals, of course. So you use a replication if you have if you want a very small RPO and maybe RTO. And uh, if you don't uh, really care about uh, RPO, but just you want a copy of the data, even if it comes from the, uh, from if, if, if it is a one day old, for example, because you, you take one backup per day, uh, and then uh, you move the backup manually to a second location, you have uh, a longer time to uh, recover from this situation. Of course, we are talking about managing processes. And again, if you have a single NAS, if you are a small company, maybe it's not too much. But actually, when you're st uh, starting to talk about medium-sized company or even very large companies, you start talking about petabytes, you start talking about multiple systems, you are talking about sometimes different vendors doing uh, uh, backups in different ways and uh, replicating data in a, even a other uh, with other mechanisms, so it becomes complicated and uh, also expensive because you need a second location. Okay, sometimes the second location could be the cloud, but how do you manage the replication to the cloud? Do you need a, a second uh, uh, virtual appliance to do it, or uh, uh, do you have a, a service? Is the virtual appliance available from every van NAS vendor that you have, and so on? So the the questions are uh really too many to answer but uh, but actually the the, um, the point here is again it's uh, it's something in between infrastructure management and having the possibility to recover your data when there is something that happens in your infrastructure or to your files also consider another aspect that for some systems and um you know recovering from backup i mean from the backup uh, software it's quite complicated. If you are dealing with a lot of users and uh, the users don't uh, don't usually lose, you know, all the data. They lose one file. So having a complicated mechanism for recovering your data means opening a ticket, waiting hours to get uh, uh, your file back from uh, from an help desk. It's too much. Okay, today it's not manageable and. Uh, I don't know, uh, and uh, but but I, I know that uh, uh, you know, thanks to the cloud and uh, with all the discussion that we have with our um, clients every day at Gigaon, we see that you know having these kind of features so that can boost productivity, not just data protection in general terms, are very useful. I, I think, for example, about snapshot or having. A, uh, your data in the cloud that is quickly accessible from other uh, with other channels if your you know local NAS your local cache is not working at that moment. Uh, what do you see, Aaron, from from uh, again from your customers in this case? So so uh, when when we're talking about uh, disaster recovery and data protection, one one important uh, point is the time the time to recovery as you mentioned. And um, in order to achieve a, a traditional approach to, to disaster recovery would be to keep an always on uh, disaster recovery site where you have a copy of all the data or replication uh, and, you, and it's uh, very expensive to pay for the second site it has to be a complete copy of uh, all your infrastructure. 
and uh, and actually and, and it's not really practical uh, for smaller smaller companies or for uh, branch offices uh, and and I think that the distributed cloud storage or as we call it the global file system provides a very good solution because uh, when uh, if you have a failure in one of your uh, offices you can immediately roll up a, a new filer in in any other location it can be in the cloud it can be in another uh, uh, location where you uh, people are able to work and uh, instead of uh, recovering or having to download the you know petabytes of information from the cloud in order to uh, until you until you're back to to operation uh, you only need to download the metadata so uh, um, the system uh, starts up it starts pulling the the names of the files or the the directories the permissions but it doesn't really need to pull uh, the data. And then you start to work in a, in a cold mode where the, the files are still, uh, they're stubs. So when people open the files, there is some delay until the files are uh, downloaded from the, the cloud storage. But uh, in the background, uh, the recovery process uh, continues to work and, and, it's, and it's guided by the, the, the areas or the things that, uh, that the users are accessing. So, so you, you, um, if a user tries to open a specific file, it becomes a, a warm file, and, and it and it starts working with uh, full uh, local uh, performance. So, so instead of downloading everything, including uh, some cold uh, data which uh, nobody accessed for months, uh, it's 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 a much faster and much uh, you know people you go you you are back to business much quicker. Yeah, indeed. So uh, there there are options. Let's say uh this so you, you can access your data from uh, somewhere else including the cloud or you can reinstall uh, uh if you have the the right people in your organization uh at the edge for example immediately a virtual uh, um, appliance or or a physical appliance uh, or you can access from the mobile uh, phone and you can get your access to your data immediately so uh, then there are mechanisms to to decide if you want to, you know, uh, a pre uh, a pre um, population of the cache, or you you can just access the, the data as it comes. So it really uh, it's all about options, and this is what most of enterprises ask today. So um, and again, maybe this brings uh, uh, the discussion to uh, to another point. So. As we we talking about disaster recovery and the option to access data remotely, but actually uh, access data remotely is now something that is uh, um, you know in our daily life. I mean, um, I, I have uh, I have a lot of stories uh, of uh, people that now work from home and their uh, their first. Uh, uh work location now has become their own they they move to the to the office only twice or thrice per week and because of that they need to have a copy of the data uh always synced to their laptop and when they access from the um, offices uh they want uh, they want uh, the data on, from the local storage like everybody else maybe it's also faster because they are working in a local area network. So the, the idea here is that uh, remote data access is now important for everybody. Okay. Uh, uh, as I said, I, I, I always use the example of my wife. My wife with, uh, with COVID, she moved at home like everybody else with the lockdown that uh, impacted to everybody. Okay. At the very beginning, they were in a, uh, in a very bad situation. I mean, they, uh, they, started to access data on traditional NAS system via VPNs and things like that. And they started having copies of this data everywhere. It was really a mess. Then they adopted a, a, system, a distributed cloud storage system and other mechanisms. And, uh, and they started to you know, work in a better way and more efficiently. And they removed uh, a lot of uh, security issues that we will talk about later, but also, you know, multiple copies, so uh, risk for productivity and, and things like that. Uh, I don't know if also for you, you have similar stories to share, Aaron, on this regard. 
uh, yeah, so I mean, the world uh, the world is really becoming flat in the you know this is a world that's completely transformed in the last uh, two years, and it's become much more flat. The uh, people can work from everywhere, and um, it it's even affects the way we're hiring people. You hire people that uh, were that are far far away, and they're able to to work. Uh, Productively, uh, no matter if they're, you know, in the same neighborhood or in this in a different country altogether. And uh, as as one example, uh, we have a, we have a company uh, customer that I like very much called Festo. Uh, they are a, a German company that uh, makes very interesting robots. Uh, I, I recommend everybody to look at their YouTube channel. They build robots that they build the houses and robots that they fly and some really amazing things. And uh, they had a problem uh, where their uh, uh, executives uh, were stuck in the uh, in United in the United States and were not able to return to uh, to Germany. And um, uh, they, they, that was really a big problem. So during the early th days of uh, COVID, there were no flights. And uh, luckily, since since they were using a global file system, they had a, a filer in in the Detroit office. And uh, they were able to actually work and access their files with uh, zero productivity disruption, uh, just as if they they were in their headquarters. So I think this is a real uh, game changer, and uh, and it's uh, a, a good a good tool in the, in a in a flat world uh, to have a flat file system that can be accessed from everywhere. Okay, I'm not sure I'm getting the, your analogy 100%, but I I follow you on this. So, and, and again, ransomware protection. This is a big, huge uh, topic. We have a section of the, of the entire webinar talk, talking about uh, ransomware protection. But, but again, pr uh, protecting your data in a traditional system is quite complicated, especially because you have to make traditional backups, okay? Yes, you have snapshot, but uh, uh, most of these snapshots are not integrated in the process. So, um creating the the necessary uh art gaps and um and mechanisms to protect against the ransomware is not that easy while using the cloud first of all you, you don't have access to data directly and most of the time uh, distributed file system can take snapshot and um create a read-only snapshots and uh, and even if everything locally in, a, in one of the many location is encrypted, you have a snapshot that can be uh, accessible in, uh, in seconds, minutes, and uh, um, recover the situation quickly, okay? So, and uh, th this is something that is really cool, and, and of course, separates again the, uh, the fact that you have an infrastructure to manage from the data, that is sits uh, on top of it. I don't know, uh, Aaron. Th these for me are key points. Okay, but uh, uh, looking uh, looking at the latest trends uh, that you know your sales uh, are reporting, uh, your your uh, customers are asking, uh, what are we missing here? Is, is there anything to add? Um, I, I think that um, um, this covers the, a lot of what they're requesting, but but there's starting to be some uh, new new trends and new requests. And one of them is uh, what's called cloud bursting, where uh, actually customers are using a hybrid environment where uh, uh, they're they're both their uh, edge locations and there's the cloud. And sometimes they want to do processing in the cloud. So for example, uh, we have a a customer that's a media company, and they they want they they often need to do rendering uh, jobs uh, that require huge uh, uh, compute power. So what they do is uh, the uh, the editors work locally in their uh, branch office in the remote office, and they they, they create the uh, uh, the low resolution uh, uh, videos or images, and then uh, uh, through the, the 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 global file system. Uh, they have they have a ability in the cloud, so in, in their case in, in, in Amazon cloud, to to run uh, um, processing jobs on the same data that they have locally. So once the the information is ready or the the, the uh, low resolution video is ready, 
they click a button and that creates hundreds of uh, instances in, in AWS that crunch these uh, videos and create the, the high resolution in 4K or 8K resolution uh, that takes a huge amount of compute power. And, and they're able to do that uh, without having to upload all the information to the cloud because it's continuously synchronized and available in the cloud. So I think this is a very interesting uh, um, approach and, and many companies are starting to embrace this uh, cloud bursting. Uh, or in, in, in order to enjoy the elasticity and the high compute power that they have available in the cloud. Yeah, in the end, uh, it's all about total cost of ownership. I mean, so uh, we, I listed the several points here. You added one more, and uh, but if we look at uh, at how you know uh, distributed cloud storage uh, is flexible, it gives you all these options that we already mentioned. Okay, that enterprises in general, all IT organizations are asking today. So they have to respond to different needs that could change every day. And by having a, a flexible infrastructure underneath, uh, um, you know, it enables them to, to answer quickly. Okay, yes, today I, I need to run a workload in the cloud. I can give you the storage there. Do you need to access uh, your data from a remote uh, location as you mentioned your customer in Detroit? I can give you data there. Or you need to expand your uh, footprint in the on-premises, I can give you more uh, expansion there, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just a data layer that is accessible from everywhere, and it's very uh, flexible and elastic in the end. So let's go to the, to the next uh, slide. I just... Uh, made a huge mistake, sorry. Uh, I'm locked out from my computer. Okay, sorry for the interruption. So what is the biggest infrastructure shift you experienced in the last couple of years? We are starting to talk about uh, COVID here. So work from home and mobile workers. Uh, to manage, of course, if you if you are in the IT team. Hybrid cloud is the factor standard now, so you're moving part of your infrastructure to the cloud. Multi-cloud is a reality, okay? So your organization, yes, started with a single cloud, and maybe, strategically speaking, you wanted to stay with a single cloud, but actually you discovered that other services are, you know, more interesting in other clouds, or some of your partners are working with other clouds, so, like it or not, you are started uh, with the multi-cloud, so now you are working with uh, more than one cloud. Uh, you are moving to a cloud-only strategy, so you are moving to move uh, everything of your data and your application to the cloud, uh, no matter if it's VMware-based cloud, as you know, cloud-native uh, services uh, or Kubernetes or whatever. And uh, last but not least, migration to SaaS application for many of your environments. And with this, I mention everything, uh, things like uh, Salesforce, but also Microsoft 365, Google Docs, anything that uh, is in the, uh, is in your uh, visibility. And of course, in this case, you can select multiple answers. So from my point of view, uh, we shifted quickly from uh, hybrid cloud to multi-cloud, and working from home is another uh, is another big hit. Uh, I don't underestimate SaaS because I saw uh, several of our clients adopting quickly Microsoft 365 or Google, even if the, before COVID they were using, uh, uh, you know, Office in the traditional version but with the addition of teams and the other tools they they moved quickly to uh, to these bundles and services from from microsoft uh aaron in uh, so if you look at your installed base your customers what what is the you know the trend that you you know uh, saw explode in the last couple of years yeah so I mean, uh, the, I, I think the obvious op option would be the one that got the most here, which is uh, work from home 
And, and indeed, we had uh, companies, including, uh, for example, a financial company with uh, over 100,000 users that was forced to move home, uh, to work from home within a day. And, and um, so I think this is an um, amazing shift. But I think uh, the, the multi-cloud is, is the emerging uh, thing that we're starting to hear more and more from customers because they, they, they really are not happy. The IT, the CIOs and the IT managers are not happy of, of being locked in to a single cloud provider. So uh, uh, for long term, uh, right? Because uh, the, the cloud providers and, uh, and especially the, the main uh, major uh, cloud uh, vendors are trying to lock you in to their cloud and they're offering a lot of uh, very nice and uh, easy to use services. But that, but that they're not uh, standard compliant, and 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 you're actually stuck with them, uh, and to, together with very high uh, costs for uh, taking your data out of the cloud, high uh, egress costs, uh, you're pretty much stuck with your cloud provider, and uh, and and really uh, it's important to think forward. So more and more uh, we're seeing the request to to have a solution that is multi-cloud uh, ready or multi-cloud capable. Uh, and when I say multi-cloud, I'm not only saying uh, able to work with different clouds and, uh, and, and to move from one cloud to another, which is very important, but also to work with multiple cloud providers concurrently. And uh, um, so uh, there are solutions that uh, support, let's say, uh, for example, also uh, uh, AWS and Azure, right? Uh, you can use AWS or Azure. And, uh, and, but how, how easy is it to move from AWS to Azure? It might uh, require you to take down the system for, for a month until all the data is moved. Uh, and you have to pay an extremely high fee for the, for the transit of the data. And and uh, and if so, would, a better solution would be to use them concurrently and to to store your data in uh, uh, portions of your data in one place, portions in another place, and to have the data management system which allows you to uh, in a click of a button to to say you want to move this portion of your data to this cloud provider. You want to store thirty percent of your data over there. You want to store the information, for, uh, for example, from the Germany office. You want to store it in a German cloud provider. So this allows you to uh, to be ready for the future, to be able to uh, uh, work with any cloud providers, to move your information like a liquid between different locations, uh, and and also to to meet with different uh, regulations that require you to store specific pieces of your data in specific places. So this is what yeah. I think we're going to see more and more in the next. Uh, a year or two. I totally agree with you. I mean, in, in general, uh, hybrid cloud and multiple multi cloud is becoming a, a common um, conversation that we have every day. And uh, multi cloud poses a lot of problems, especially when we talk about data gravity. So, as you mentioned, uh, uh, there are a couple of risks. Of, uh, in putting all your data in a single cloud because if you have to move it or access it from a remote uh, uh, location you have to make uh, a copy of the data so it takes a lot of time and it costs uh, a lot in ingress fees while having a solution that allows you to distribute the data and then access it globally of course limit this this cost uh, the migration could be uh, more uh, you know, manage it e easily uh, from the back end without impacting uh, any service in the front end. So there are several options to adopt this kind of system, of course. But again, uh, work from home was for everybody. So I have a, a lot of stories that I gathered in the last uh, couple of years on uh, how different organization moved to you know, uh, COVID. We talk a lot about digital transformation, how many companies change it, the way they work to access, uh, you know, to have everything more digitalized so that they don't need the physical uh, access to uh, to system. They don't need paper. They don't need, uh, um, you know, things that are difficult to manage uh, over distances. And uh, and again, uh, for example, uh, my wife is my example because she works for a for a company that has 500 employees distributed uh, in Italy. And when uh, she, she works in the main office, but actually there are other offices that were impacted at the same identical day, and they have to move at all. 
So all the companies started to work at home. Some of them with their laptops, others with uh, uh, company provided laptops. So it was a risk. There was risk again uh, uh, security. So security is no longer something that you think about. Uh, you know the perimeter. Maybe not even before, but actually today we are talking about everybody could be remote, or you have a uh, very hybrid situation situations with people in uh, different locations some in the headquarters some uh, at home and you need to think about security differently than in the past there, there are several um, aspects that were not considered before so you you have to protect the data and not longer the systems okay and uh, so by saying that uh, of course we we can start talking about different uh, uh, points. Digital transformation is real. Okay, we see a capacity growth everywhere because we are using many more uh, data sources now. Okay, so it's not only uh, human-generated stuff, but there is a lot of uh, machine-generated stuff that we are storing in our system. We can talk about IoT. We can talk about uh, um, sensors that are uh, available in manufacturing plants but also uh, the fact that we are storing and moving much more data across teams today than uh, we did in the past okay and uh, i see uh, my wife for example collaborating with uh, her colleagues uh, uh, all the week and she can do this hybrid uh, uh, work from home slash work from uh, the office every week and so they have to collaborate they create documents they uh, they make a modification to this document they need to access older versions sometimes so they need collaboration tools and they need uh, and they create a huge amount of data compared to a couple of years ago so digital transformation is real of course it's beneficial for everybody but you know you you need to have a, a flexible storage system to uh, to keep uh, uh, up with this pace of change. Um, I don't know, uh, Aaron, if you have any other anecdote or, or story to tell around this. Yeah, so I, I think um, uh, from our, you know, uh, all of us, uh, we had the, the shock therapy and uh, suddenly in, uh, in a day or in a week, we, we all were forced to change all the way we, we work and uh, to work at home. And it was a really a, a tectonic shift in the world. And um, I think that the, the, the situation is even more complicated in areas where uh, people are working on uh, large, large uh, files or large pieces of information. Uh, take, for, for example, the media industry, uh, where uh, a graphic artist may more work on files that are uh, gigabytes inside, or uh, uh, a video producer may work on uh, even terabytes, uh, right? So how? How do you move these people to work from home? It's it's nearly impossible with uh, traditional technologies uh, to meet, to move these uh, these amounts of data and to move them uh, differentially and efficiently and and to be able to access them from uh, multiple locations across the world. And and uh, what do we do with this situation? Uh, uh, we actually adopt this uh, situation and we we take the benefits from this situation by hiring people from uh, that work. Uh, different countries that, that have different uh, uh, culture, different capa uh, capabilities. We can we can hire people from every, everywhere. We want to continue to make this uh, uh, transformation. Uh, also after COVID, we we, we learned the, the good things about uh, working remotely and working in a small uh, and, uh, and 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 distributed way. And in order to have yeah. that, we need a distributed file system. We need a distributed place, a distributed copy of the data that is the gold copy of all the information of the, the enterprise and we need to make it available to, to all our employees uh, wherever they are yes in fact my second point was work from home but actually it's not only work from home it's much more complex than that because uh, in my experience there are companies rethinking how they are uh, relocating uh, people so instead of having huge offices now they are thinking about having smaller offices sometimes or even smaller headquarters because they already know that they won't have everybody in the company every day but actually sometimes 
they are thinking about you know the remote offices in the same way so instead of having 50 people at the office they are planning for 20 or even five and maybe having two or three offices in the same city so that they can uh, limit the commute time or other things like that because with the, these kind of platforms they can everybody can access data anyway okay so if you are implementing the right data platform data management platform in the um, in the back end then you can act, uh, access from everywhere so you know uh, you can work from all you can work from a small office you can work from whatever you want and uh, by um, so as I mentioned, there are new tools that are transforming workloads and business. Okay, it's not only about uh, about having access to data, but sometimes it's also about having you know analytics tools and understanding what is happening so that you can plan in advance. It's much easier to have you know everything concentrated on, in a in a single system and taking, for example, uh, data out of it uh that it's you can analyze and say okay we, we are this is our trends we, this is what is happening so and you can make better choices about the future of infrastructure also there is another important aspect that is uh, as we mentioned data access from everywhere okay and this is probably simple uh, from the concept point of view but actually very complex because uh now people want to access data from their mobile phone uh, as if they uh, access it from uh, from their uh, laptop or when they are in the, in the office from uh, from uh, from desktop computers so this is changing the way they access the data the way they use the data and of course we mentioned for several years ah it is possible to, to have you know sync and share but sync and share is a small part of the entire uh, mechanism that we are describing because uh, sync and share is good for just uh, you know for a few workflows or a few um, type of uh, um, work actually you need uh, freedom of access to your data depending on the type of application that is accessing the data and the users and because most of the these workloads now are automated you need to to have traditional protocols uh, I, I don't know uh, if aaron you agree with me about this so uh, the multiple options depending also on, on the fact that you may have uh, uh, the need that the same data is assessed at the same time by humans and machines or applications yeah. So, so think and share is really, you know, uh, transformed the, the way many of us think about collaboration and uh, products like uh, Dropbox and Google Drive are part of, uh, you know, when we uh, do our personal uh, personal business, uh, many of us use these uh, very good and inexpensive tools. Uh, but this is really uh, not a uh, ideal solution for for an enterprise. An enterprise, first of all, has a lot of uh, typically has a lot of legacy devices they have uh, you have filers that have uh, uh, hundreds of terabytes of uh, pre information and most of you don't even have any idea what's on these filers it's it's just a big uh, collection of data some of it is old some of it is new there's no, there's no real way to move these things to shink and share you don't know this requires you to change all the permissions of the files and to to understand which are the files here they are sensitive and uh, uh, so, so what uh, what uh, if you have a large uh, uh, legacy uh, of files and every enterprise has it, uh, you really need uh, to preserve the permissions uh, structure that you had, to preserve the directory structure, to preserve, uh, so, so existing applications, for example, when they expect to see the file in a specific shared network drive, they would see it in the same, with the same drive letter in the same location and with the same permissions, right? Because otherwise, uh, it's almost impossible to migrate uh, to sync and share, which requires a totally different uh, structure, hierarchy of the, the file system and ways for sharing the files and ways for setting the permissions. So, so it's really not, uh, not an ideal solution. And, um, and there are also many legacy systems or, or systems that assume that they have a file system level access 
um, yeah, you have you may have a manufacturing plant, and and there are machines that access the files uh, from a file or in specific locations or in specific uh, paths. They, they it's, it's it's almost impossible to change. So so you, I think that uh, enterprises what they really need is a, a, a holistic solution, the, a global file system that has different uh, ways to access the same data. Uh, you can access the data using filers, using traditional protocols like SMB and NFS, and you can access uh, the same information like in the EFSS world uh, using uh, mobile, your mobile phone or from your agents on your, your laptops or, or desktops. So, so I, think, I think it's very important in order to, to achieve this uh, better collaboration that the EFSS promises, uh, but to make it real in the world of the enterprise, you need this kind of holistic solution that offers uh, like a hybrid between both of these uh, worlds. Okay, and then as we mentioned, data assets control and management are really, uh, really important because you need to have a, this global uh, data access management. Uh, otherwise, it, it becomes impossible to to manage uh, uh, access from uh, everywhere and. Uh, uh, and with this, we introduce the next topic, which is security. So you really need a different approach to security. So let's step in with the uh, next uh, poll. How can you describe your ransomware protection strategy? Okay. So we have a strong dedicated solution in place. Backup on an immutable target. Uh, a mix of standard backups and dedicated solutions. We are testing multiple solutions. We are still looking for a solution. This is a very odd topic today, Aaron, and uh, uh, I encountered practically in the last year all the all the situation. Less of the last one. Sometimes is more about that. Uh, uh, you know, users are not happy to say that they are not uh, yet ready, but. Uh, uh, it's true that you know um, many many users were caught uh, off guard because they didn't have the right solution in place. They didn't uh, know it was a real threat until you know the um, the news hit the 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 magazines or you know uh, or online publications. I mean, I thought uh, several of these attacks uh, and ransomware. Uh, and everything caught really a lot of organization of guard, especially uh, organization like uh, in the in the healthcare where maybe money is uh, is uh, more difficult to for this kind of uh, um, investment to to have, or for example, is difficult because they have very um, complex infrastructure. Most of them are not really managed directly by them because they, they buy a lot of equipment that they include other technology and they don't have control of this technology. So for some of these, for several reasons, protecting from ransomware is very difficult. And, uh, and again, uh, we saw a lot of uh, uh, different answers. Uh, from, uh, from your point of view, so did you see any ransomware attack on your customer and how they uh, reacted to these ransomware attacks. Yeah, so, so we've, we've seen a huge explosion of ransomware in our customers, uh, and uh, this is a, almost another pandemic, uh, and it's a, a very, very scary time for, you know, especially, as you mentioned, the healthcare organizations and engineering. We had uh, one customer, for example, that was hit uh, recently by ransomware, and they had $200 million worth of project data that was uh, encrypted. And, and, and uh, but, uh, but uh, once you, uh, it's much easier to, to recover from ransomware once you, in order to recover, you need actually three, three different uh, things. You need, uh, first of all, an instant, the ability to instantly roll back uh, files uh, or uh, folders to previous versions uh, in order to, uh, Revert this uh, this attack, and then it needs to happen quickly without uh, re-downloading, you know, uh, terabytes of information back from the cloud. It needs to to work uh, almost instantly. Uh, you need also to have uh, because the the attackers, you know, are very advanced. 
and they often hide in your network for a while before they, they actually uh, mount the attack. They, they're able to move laterally and to destroy different backup systems that you have uh, in order to, to make it harder for you to recover. So it's extremely important to have uh, the backup system, the, where the places where you store your, your snapshots or backup, to be in a separate location, and it should be immutable. So uh, they, it should be uh, protected in a way that makes it almost impossible for even a smart attacker to destroy your backups. Uh, so so we, object storage is a good, uh, a good solution for uh, having immutable uh, storage. And finally, uh, another uh, thing that uh, they, they, they are struggling, that you're struggling with once you're hit by ransomware is to identify the scope of the attack and to find which files were encrypted and which files were are, are safe and to be able to to roll back only the specific files that were uh, that were uh, targeted so you need some kind of a data management data discovery solution that allows you to uh, easily uh, search your data see which files were modified who modified them uh, at which at which time and uh, and to be able to selectively create a list of these files and roll them back in an, in a, in an easy way yeah one of the you know um answers that we saw in that uh, in this poll is that many for many people uh, there are backup on uh, immutable targets and uh, a mix of standard backups and dedicated solutions to protect against ransomware one of the uh, most important things that i saw on uh, on uh, about ransomware attacks is recovery time so uh, the problem is not just uh, having uh, uh having the uh data back but is in uh, your uh recovery time object so if you need to be productive again five days is this good enough if you need two days is this good enough or do you want it immediately back so that that's that's the problem with some of the solution out there so it's not that you are not protected you will recover the situation but actually when will you be able to be productive again? So uh, from this point of view, so prevention and anomaly detection is the first thing. So we want to be uh, ahead of the attack. As soon as we um, find that there is a large number of files uh, um, in the uh, modified all, uh, all in a sudden, maybe uh, flag an alarm something like that that will be very beneficial to understand what is happening check the files immutable backups we said is another huge part of uh, uh, of this uh, prevention because you are just uh, keeping uh, uh, copies of your data in uh, immutable volumes so it could be snapshot it could be uh, object lock in uh, in s3 in the way in the in an object store so it could be anything it could be a tape okay but you want to something that is not easy easily accessible from uh, from these people and also you have to think about uh, creating this eye gap sometimes it's a physical sometimes it's logical so you make a copy of your data and then you uh, break the connection for the time between uh, uh, between the copies so we are sure that they are physically separated or you have again um, all these mechanisms that prevent uh, direct access to the data so that you have you need multiple uh, access layers to before uh, getting access to the data including multi-factor authentication to get access to the to the to the snapshot or anything or before deleting something you need a, a double check uh, from two different people in your organization and things like that and uh, uh, and then there are other problems i mean when you see the ransomware uh, happening probably something else happened before so as aaron said there are several occasions where uh, the ransom uh, software is there uh, silent for a long time okay and we saw in the in the last uh, uh, year or so that uh, a lot of these attacks yes ended up with a, a ransom request, but before they uh, had the possibility to get access to a lot of data. So uh, get your data 
and maybe they can do a lot of things with this data so they, they can uh, resell this data to your competition they they can use it for uh, uh, for other purposes and most of them of course are illegal so all of them actually are illegal so that that's very important to understand so you want all this prevention you want all these mechanism mechanism in place just to prevent uh, that your data is leaked or uh, is encrypted by these uh, people and then there is physical security at the edge okay so we talked about accessing data from everywhere but actually the edge shouldn't be your problem okay so data at the edge should be always encrypted everything should be as always encrypted the communication should be encrypted and if you lose the device you don't really care about the device itself because it's encrypted and so uh, it can be the data in it can be reused uh, i mean uh, i think that citera has a, a mechanism like this like or, or at least i i would expect that the remote device is encrypted right uh, right Aaron? yes yes uh, when the when the device is encrypted uh, we have capabilities to detect uh, to detect this and to to roll back the device to an earlier version um, so uh, at the edge location uh, almost immediately very good and uh... And so, in general, you have to uh, start having a different approach around security. So you have to uh, put policy in place to protect the data and no longer the device or no longer the NAS system because uh, you have these global file systems. So you, it's way easier to uh, apply policies because you have to write one policy and not uh, hundreds or you have to replicate these policies across the entire infrastructure so it becomes easier to define uh, fine-grained policies that you can uh, put on top of your data to protect it better and with this last slide and sorry we are very late today we this conversation was very interesting so this is our market landscape for distributed cloud storage as you can see citera won uh, uh the leadership position this year and why is that uh as i described at the beginning citera is the company that uh, showed the um broader um set of uh, solutions for access to data across different environments and uh, at the same time they have the highest uh, uh security levels and they can provide uh, one of the uh, most flexible backends in the end because they can access multiple clouds, multiple objects stored in the backend. They can uh, have uh, multiple ways to uh, store the data in the backend depending on policies that you can uh, uh, set in your system. So uh, other vendors are doing pretty well and um, this is a very very interesting market because you know th there is a lot of demand from users uh, in uh, practical all verticals and uh, another another aspect that is quite important is also that uh, uh, in some cases you are accessing solutions like citera even if you are in a very small organization and maybe you don't think you have uh, uh you you have these needs but actually the service provider is using a, um, a solution like citera to provide you the service so remote nas sync and share and uh, other file services all connected together am i wrong here uh aaron uh yeah i just need to to uh, to thank you for i mean we were very very humbled to receive from giga on the leader and outperformer position in this uh, very, very uh, secure, uh, uh, serious and meticulously researched uh, uh, paper. And I, I think you have uh, checked uh, you know, very carefully a lot of the aspects in the different solutions. And it was a very, very happy day to me when we, we learned that we were the leader of this report. Very good. And thank you again, everybody. Sorry, we don't have the time to answer your questions today but we will answer them uh, via email in the following days uh, if you need uh, anything uh, 
uh, more about uh, distributed cloud storage or you want to access uh, other reports from Gigam, just contact us on uh, gigam.com and where you will find my research and all the, uh, the other reports available from uh, from uh, our firm. Uh, Aaron, where well, we can contact you if uh, uh, our audience wants uh, to uh, continue the conversation. So thank you, thank you, Enrico, and I'll be very happy if you contact me on LinkedIn. I will uh, uh, answer every question that I receive uh, through LinkedIn, and uh, I will be happy to be in touch with you uh, in, the, in that platform. So my, my username there is Aaron Brandt. Very good. Thank you again, everybody, and bye-bye. Uh,